Yeah. Phew. <laughs> Uh, that's what somebody said in the first service. You go home now. Amen to that. Oh, I don't know how anybody in their right mind would miss this if they had any choice in the matter. How could you miss this? Time in the Lord like this. Oh, amen. Nope, I'm, I'm switched. There we go. Okay, let's get back on our trip. We're on a trip. We're going over to Asia. We're going over to Turkey. We're going back in time to the early 50s A.D. We're going deep into the Word to see what God did and what He said to the people of Ephesus. When Paul first shared the gospel there, it was around 53 A.D. He was just on a layover, waiting for the next ship to get back to Jerusalem. But he went to the synagogue and spoke there, and they wanted to hear more. And he left Priscilla and Aquila there. I want you to think about that, because that was not Priscilla and Aquila's plan. They did not set out to go and spend years in Ephesus. What was their plan? We don't know. They were traveling with Paul. Maybe they were excited about going to Jerusalem, worshiping in the temple, meeting the saints there, being a part of what was going on on that scale, but they were flexible and they were ready servant missionaries for Jesus Christ and they stayed in Ephesus. That's the way we need to be. Wherever the Lord says go, we need to go. And wherever He says stay, we need to stay. Amen? And so Priscilla and Aquila stayed. Paul came back around the fall of 54 AD, a year and a half later, and we read that he spent... In chapter 19, we read that he spent three months speaking boldly in the synagogue, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. That's verse 8. And some believed and some didn't. And their unbelief turned to being obstinate. And then they publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them and he took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And this went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. All of them in the whole province heard the word of the Lord. Okay, so we see this model. When it was possible, there was a lecture time in a, in a big hall where people could listen to teaching and be, and be lectured. And then there was also ministry that went from house to house. And that's how that worked. Today we'll read that in verse 22, Paul will stay in the province of Asia with his base of operations being Ephesus for a little longer. So we've had three months, two years, and then a little longer, coming to about three years. And in this three years, let's look at the description of what God's doing, what's happening in these years. First off, verse 10 again, all who lived in the province heard the word of the Lord. That's what we must do. We need to get the word of the Lord to every house in our catchment area. Somehow, some way. If it's a little pamphlet, if it's a little... We need to get the word of the Lord to everyone. That should be absolutely our number one priority as a church. Let's get the word to everybody in our area. As they did. So nobody can say, I didn't know. We want to make sure everybody knows that there's a church that's seeking them and there's a God who's loving them. All. Also, we see in verse 11 that God did extraordinary miracles with towels and aprons. And Paul, that, that's amazing. So everybody's hearing, the word's getting out, and God's doing extraordinary miracles. And in verse Just prior to verse 17, we have these seven sons of Sceva who decide uh, as sorcerers they're going to cast out, use this powerful name of Jesus who's being spread all around, they're going to they're gonna kind of add him to their bag of tricks and incantations. And so they start throwing the name Jesus around. In the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, I command you to come out. And on this one occasion, this demon who's possessed this man, he jumps all over these guys and beats them naked and bleeding, and they run out of the house. And it says in verse 17, if you're following along, 
that when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. We, we see this movement just picking up more and more and more power and more and more and more people. In verse 18, it says that secret believers openly confessed. They had been keeping it quiet. They, they were afraid of, of what it might do to their life, to their world, if they let everybody know that they've, been, they've given their life to Jesus, so they were a secret. But all of a sudden, in verse 18, now that the name of Jesus is getting more and more powerful, they, they came out and they said, I have given my life to Jesus. And sorcerers, verse 19, burn their scrolls. Burn their scrolls. 50,000 drachmas was the value of these scrolls. That's, that's millions of dollars in today's money. They could have sold them. They could have said, I don't need this anymore. You know, they, they could have thought pragmatically, I don't need this, but maybe you know, you'd like to use it. And I, I hate to just throw it away, so I'll just give it to you. They, they saw the, the evil in the sorcery. They saw the, 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 that was contrary to God's plan and, that his, and his word and, and the gospel. And so they, they burned them. This is awesome. This is an awesome movement of God that we're reading about. This is not a revival because there was no, no life. This is new birth. People are coming to Christ, and it's happening in a powerful, powerful way. And it's, this is the way it's happened before in the book of Acts. At Pentecost, chapter 2, 3,000 people believed. In chapter 4, those 3,000 became 5,000. In chapter 6, it says the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, meaning that they can no longer be counted. We're just beyond counting them now. It's just multiplying greatly. In, verse, in chapter 9 of Acts, it says that the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. In Syrian Antioch, in Acts 11, it says the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. In Pisidian Antioch, in Acts 13, it says the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. That's down in the southern part there. I don't know if that's considered Galatia or what. Yeah, where is it? Pisidian. It's like Cilicia and Lycia and Pamphylia, that, that, that area right there. They all heard about it. It's getting covered. In Lystra, Iconium, and Derby, chapter 16, verse 5, it says, So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. And this is just this massive move that God is reaching all these people and spreading out in the short time, person to person to person to person. And this is just one branch of the tree. Because we are following now Paul and his missionary journeys. We're following just Paul. There were 12 apostles. And all those disciples that walked with Jesus. And they're all going. And so we have Peter and Andrew and James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James. They're all spreading out and they're taking the branches everywhere. Untold thousands whose names and stories we will never know this side of heaven went out. And you are an extension of these branches. You are. You're saved today because of people who went and took the word out. Are you saved because of what happened at Ephesus? I don't know. Are you part of that branch? Or are you part of Thomas's branch or somebody else's branch? I don't know. Are you hearing the word of today because of their receiving it then? Think about this because we are so individualistic that we think that it all has to do with me. Whether I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord or not. But it's not just about you. It's about who comes after you. Your children. And those that will hear because you received. We're all part of the tree. We're all part of the branches that are spreading out through the world. This movement in Ephesus is amazing. Amazing. What's going to happen next? Well, today, our outline, as we look at verses 21 through 41, has a lot of C's in it. But I stand by it. Sherry made fun of me this morning. He said, I need more C's in this outline. <laughs> but I stand by it more than most outlines. Because we'll see the character of a real Christian conversion 
confusion of a riotous crowd and the calamity of a compromise. Let's begin with verses 21 through 27. The word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Kratos. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I've been there, he says, I must visit Rome also. That's That's the rest of the book of Acts. He just said in one verse everything that's going to happen after this. He's not going to get to Rome the way he thinks he's going to get to Rome, but he's going to get to Rome. But I I show this to say that this is his plan. He's going to go from Asia to Macedonia up there by Philippi and Thessalonica, and he's going to go down to Achaia, Corinth, going to go far east back to Jerusalem, and then he's going to be taken all the way to Rome. That's going to happen. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia. And so he's still in Asia, but he's preparing now for the move. And he sends Timothy and Erastus to Macedonia. Well, he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. And if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9, it, it, Paul talks about this trip. He talks about, he, he writes 1 Corinthians at this point, and he's, he talks about this plan and what he's doing. He talks about sending these guys, and, and he says that right now a great door has opened to me, but also great opposition. 1 Corinthians 69. We'll see the great opposition and the great door. Verse 23. About that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. Was this predictable? When God does something amazing, is it not going to be answered by the other side? About that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius who made silver shrines of Artemis Brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He brought in a lot of business. He called them together along with the workers in related trades and said, You know, my friends, we receive a good income from this business. And, I, and you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and made it, and, and, in, practic, and, 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 and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says the gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There's danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. Let's pray. Lord, I get a feeling that today is not just another day in church. So God, please help us. Build in us an expectation that you want something from us today. Help us to give it to you. Oh God, please don't let us let you down today in the preaching of the word, hearing the word, and the responding of the word. We pray, God, for those who haven't yet given you their heart and their life and their love. Please, God, let today be the day. And God, please speak to our hearts now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Ephesus, as we've seen, is a stronghold of demons and idols. And Demetrius says about Paul that Paul says man-made gods are no gods at all. Did Paul actually say that? Yes, he did. He really did. Uh, You know, how should we say these things in a culture where, where people don't believe? We need to say it with love. We need to say it in truth. We need to say it according to the scriptures with gentleness and respect. But we need to say it. And Paul did say it. If you look at Acts chapter 17, 29, when he's talking to the philosophers in Athens, he said, We should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. He called the the philosophers of Athens ignorant. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent, for he has set a day. When he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed, he's given proof of this, by, to, this to everyone by raising him from the dead. It's not, it's not loving to just be polite and let people go to hell. The judge is coming. Let's love people enough to tell them. Idols, we see in this reading here, they, they're, they're nothing. They're nothing. They're no gods at all. And yet they have power. It, an idol is a demon's chief means of keeping you 
from coming to Christ or keeping you from, li for, from living for Christ. I want to introduce you to Artemis. Is that the next slide? I don't know if it is or not, but let's go to... Uh, go, there she is. Artemis. Artemis, <laughs> we'll read here in a minute, uh, is allegedly came down from heaven, the image of Artemis came down from heaven for them to make idols and make figurines and things so that she would be pleased and be honored and, and, and give people good luck or good fortune or whatever else. Artemis is, well, she's something. She's covered in bosoms. I, I, I don't know how else to say it, head to toe. She is, uh, she's quite a goddess, and uh, she is alarming. She's the one that they are serving. Our first thing that we see in this passage, though, is that the character of real Christian conversion, the character of real Christian conversion is directly related to idols. Because when we encounter the gospel, the gospel identifies and isolates idols. People all over this city are burning their scrolls. They're burning their sorcerer scrolls. They're, they're saying, I, I, don't, I know this is valuable, and I don't care because God's more important than money, than making money off these things. And God's more important than, I'm turning away from that. People are separating from their unbelieving synagogue. The synagogue that they grew up in. The synagogue where they were on the cradle roll where their family is, and where they have seats. This is my seat. That's where I sit. That's my synagogue. And they're saying, God's calling me out of this because it doesn't speak the truth anymore. Christ is not in the synagogue. And so they're, they're walking away from idols. Idols like comfort and even family. They're publicly confessing their faith in Christ, putting Him first above everything else. People are getting mad at family members who are turning to Christ. You're, you're forsaking us. You're walking away from your family. It still happens today. The Holy Spirit was moving. People are changing, and they're changing radically. And when the gospel really gets a hold of a person, they lay down their idols. And they walk away from their idols. And when they walk away from their idols, if enough people do it like it's happening here, it changes the city. All of a sudden, things are different. What would it be like if we had a move like this in this city? Well, all the people who are expecting to sell a lot of alcohol would all of a sudden not sell so much alcohol. All the people who are trying to make money on lottery tickets are not making money on lottery tickets. Well, what's Planned Parenthood supposed to do when everybody's making Jesus their Lord and Master? The world changes, the economy changes when people are confronted with the gospel and they lay down their idols. And the city is impacted. Demetrius, a leader in the craftsman guild, like a union, but even... More so than that, or all these men who depend on each other for their business in one way or another. This Christian movement is bad for the bottom line. People aren't buying idols like they're supposed to. We, we had a plan. We had, you know, speculation or, or, or something like that. We, we knew what we were expecting this year. We, we're counting on it. Nobody's buying the idols. All the people across Asia Minor have been led astray. That's the way they see it. This is bad for business. You ever known religious people who separate business from religion? That's, that's, this is business, right? This is business. Don't, don't, don't talk to me about religion. This is business. It all goes together when Jesus is Lord. It's bad for tourism. This is, this is Disney World. This is Disney. This is tourism central. This, this building, this, this temple of Artemis of the Ephesians is the biggest building in the world. They couldn't build a skyscraper, but they could build a great big building. A building that's 377 feet long, 151 feet wide, all marble, 127 columns that are all 40 foot high, and then the, the roof is on top of that, 60 feet tall, the whole building. I don't know if you've seen or, or visited the, the Parthenon or the Parthenon replica in Nashville, uh, but that, that temple to Athena... This is massively more large than that. 
phenomenal building, one of the seven wonders of the world. And people go there for tourism, and they're not buying the trinkets. They're not spending the money. This is not good for them. You see, when we encounter the gospel, it identifies and isolates our idols. Because if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart God raised Him from the dead, we'll be saved. But confessing Him truly as Lord, that word being kurion means master, owner. Master, making Jesus your master, making Jesus your owner, your ultimate authority means that everything else goes here. And He goes here. And it causes a conflict with the idols in our lives. And the real Christian conversion means that Christ wins the conflict. That's the real Christian conversion. Christ wins the conflict. If your conversion didn't change your path, then it's not the real Christian conversion. Because you're still serving your idols. In Ephesus, the Jews idolized their religion, and the pagans and Greeks, they, they had a mixture of sorcery, spiritism, and this Artemis worship and greed. Do you have a sense of who your idols are or what your idols are? An idol is the thing in your life that gives your life meaning. An idol is the thing in your life that gives your life meaning. And if it were taken away, it would take with it, your reason for living. That's what your idol is. Does that help? Do you need an illustration? Take the phone out of a hand of a teenager and watch the rage. I actually knew a teenager that committed su- wanted to commit suicide, tried to commit suicide, because the parents had finally taken the phone away reason for living what are our idols what are we living for what can we not live without the greeks and the romans they they had a sense for this and they had gods for these i'll give you two names one's the greek name one's the roman name but aphrodite venus were the goddesses of beauty and love and sex appeal apollo or phoebus was the God, were the God, were, are the God of youth, music, and sun. We still serve the idols of beauty, love, and sex appeal. Do we still serve the God of youth, music, and sun? We have people in our membership that are out on the water today worshiping youth, music, and sun. Athena, Minerva, the goddesses of wisdom, knowledge, and art. Dionysus or Bacchus, the gods of drinking and having a good time. Pluto or Hades, the god of money and possessions. And then there's Artemis, also known as Diana, the god of hunting and the moon. Very, very popular in rural settings. Hunting, as you can imagine, hunting and the moon. Remember the times when you'd get up early, early in the morning with the moon and go hunting? You're serving the idol. Instead, on Sunday morning, you're serving the idol of Artemis or Diana when you choose that over worship of your God. We still sacrifice to these idols today. What or who are your idols? An idol is a master. It dominates your choices and overrides your values. Love somebody. Oh, I'm just, I, I just want to love somebody. I, I want to have that person in my life. I'm living. My, my meaning for being, my reason for living is that somebody might be there I can love, that I'm pursuing this relationship with all that I have. This is the most important thing to me, to love somebody, to have somebody. And when we finally get that person, they become our idol and they come first. And they cause us to make choices. And, and, and those choices override our values of what we know is right and wrong. Because the idol comes first. And that idol gives life 
meaning. I'm in this relationship now. That gives me meaning. And you don't think you can live without her or him? So to please that one who has become your idol, you do things you know you shouldn't do. And that's worship. When you, when you do things to please your idol, you're worshiping it. We gather here to please God. We're worshiping Him. Well, when you do things to please your loved one, your lover, that you know you shouldn't do, you're worshiping that idol. And if you've given your life to Jesus, Jesus is no longer the most important relationship in your life. You've picked up an idol. Your faithfulness to your first love is now dominated by the idol. And so you do things that you know the scriptures God tells you not to do. Like having a relationship with an unbeliever. Doing things physically outside of marriage that are only intended for husband and wife. Living with somebody you're not married to. These are compromises for the sake of your idol. And if you're a Christian and you're doing these things, this is a broken promise. Because when you pray the sinner's prayer, you took an oath that Jesus would be your Lord that Jesus would be your king, that he'd be your master and your ultimate authority, and, you're, and you, you, you've, you've broken your oath. You're committing adultery. You made a public declaration at your baptism, and this is all spiritual adultery now because you're, 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 un, you're living unfaithfully to Jesus, your Lord, and you're having an affair, an adulterous affair with an idol. Other idols are money and possessions. Parents who sacrifice time with their children, the raising of their children, or literally sacrifice the life of their children because of their vocation, because of making money, because they think that's more important at this time. Public approval and popularity. What will people say? What will people think? Oh, we've got to do what people approve of, right? That's our idol for so many of us. Family. A wife, a husband, a child can be an idol. You know if you idolize your child, it's catastrophic for that child and for you. A child can't handle the weight of your worship and your expectations. You go to the ball field and watch the kid, watch the parents lose their minds because of their worship of their children. Ah! You see this rage, a little riot. Strike three, no! Umpire, you're blind. <laughs> that wasn't a foul. They, go, they lose their minds because of this idolatry. Right? Idolizing your child is going to end badly. You're either going to chase them away, you're going to smother them and spoil them, appease them. Eventually they are going to move away and you're going to be left meaningless. You may appease them. This is going to be misery for you because they're going to, they're not going to be a good God. It will dominate you and frustrate you. You will compromise your values. Idols always make us compromise our values and even change your beliefs. A child, oh, well, my child's living with somebody outside of wedlock now. I guess that's not so bad after all. My child, well, turns out they're living a homosexual lifestyle. I guess that's not so bad after all. You idolize your children and you change your values to accommodate and appease. And you leave the word of God and you leave the God who you gave yourself to. God help us with our idols. At the invitation today, whether you come to the altar or not, my prayer is that you profoundly come back to the first commandment. Put no other gods before him. Put no other gods before him. And that'll take care of all the other commandments. Encountering the gospel identifies and isolates our idols, and encountering the gospel confronts idols, and idols don't like it. That's what happens here, and we have this riot. Let me, let's, let's read the next the next parts here. Confusion of a riotous crowd. Confusion of a riotous crowd. Verse 28. When they heard this, they were furious. All the people of the city, those that are 
losing money. He began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Soon the whole city was in uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd. I'll go talk to him. But the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front, and they shouted instructions to him. And he motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. This is a psychology of a riot. A small group of people meet with, with common goals and interests, and they have an agenda, and they decide to manipulate everybody. And if you notice, the thing that, they was, that was most important to them is not Artemis, it's money. But they influence and manipulate the masses for their means. And friends, it happens all the time. People are rioting today, and they don't even know. It's confused. Most people didn't even know why they were there. People are in the streets today thinking they're doing something good. They, they don't know what they're doing, and they don't know that they're being used. And there's great money and outrage from every political perspective. And those of us who aren't paying attention, we don't realize we're being manipulated by people who are just making money off our outrage. We need to, we need to calm down. Stop being so easily manipulated by people who are just trying to use us. Amen? This riot happens. <laughs> it dawned on me in the first service. What did you do in a riot when everything's made out of rocks and there's no windows to break? It's hard. To, there's no cars to flip. Well, they do it pushing cows over. I had to, ah! Flip a cart. <laughs> Hard to have a riot in this setting. But they screamed a lot and they yelled a lot and they rushed into the theater. And I showed you this theater uh, a couple of weeks ago. The 120, sit with seat, 125,000 people and they're all rushing in there. Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling commander, pushed to the front. Everybody is screaming, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. I don't know what's up. What's going, what is happening? I don't know. Well, screaming, yelling, rioting. Don't know why. The Jews who are not Christians, they're the Jewish non-believers, they're like, we, we need to let everybody know we're not with these guys. We're not with the Christians who are causing the trouble. So they, Alexander, you get out there and you tell them. And Alexander's like, okay, I need to tell you that we're not with them. But as soon as he, they hear his voice and they see that he's a Hebrew, they just start screaming, two hours, great as Artemis of the Ephesians, great as Artemis of the Ephesians, great as Artemis of the Ephesians, for two hours. Good grief. That's all I have to say about that. And then finally, the calamity of compromise, verse 35. You see that there are people in government who are leaders, who are friends of Paul. They're like people of peace. They're not necessarily believers, but they've, they've seen that these Christians are different, and the difference is good. These Christians are letting their light so shine before men that, they, that the name of their God will be glorified in heaven. And so they're like, you know, the sorcery, the, the idol worship, the greed, that's all wicked stuff. And these people are awful, but these Christians are different. They're changing. And so even these political leaders who haven't yet put their faith, they, they see the value. And so you have these guys begging Paul. Paul's like, let me at them. I'll tell them. I'll tell, Your gods are nothing. Like, Please, Paul, no, 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 don't do it. 125,000 people will rip you in a million pieces. So verse 35, the calamity of compromise. The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and her image, which fell from heaven? Uh, 
Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, did the, did the image of Artemis fall from heaven? Is this undeniable? Somebody took a lumpy rock, threw it over a wall, and everybody got excited. Whoa! Artemis, I want you both! Lumpy rock! Let's worship it! Undeniable. These facts are undeniable. You know the Christians in the, in the hearing of this are going, uh. Oh. Paul's about to come out of his skin. Let me out there. i got to tell him the truth. This is not undeniable. This clerk says, you ought to calm down. and Do not do anything rash. You brought these men here, though they've neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. Have they blasphemed their goddess? Yeah. They said she's no god at all. So, yeah, that's not true. There's several things in here not true. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. They can press charges. If there's anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we're in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there's no reason for it. After he said this, he dismissed the assembly. This is a... This is a guy trying to defend Paul and the, and the Christians. This is a guy trying to help. But his help is a compromise. It's, it's, it's not true. It, it, it's trying to pacify with, with, with untruth. Ephesus is a free city. Rome, Rome does not rule Ephesus. They have been given the privilege of having their own government and having their own rule as long as they're cooperating, behaving themselves. And they're in jeopardy of losing that. And so he's trying to make peace. And he's trying to make peace. And, you know, if he has to bend the truth a little bit, eh. But we're, we're going to see over 40 years of ministry as we do this walk through Ephesus. We're going to see over 40 years of ministry in Ephesus, what God did, how he did it, what happened. And we saw here this tremendous move, like, like a rocket shot. And I want to tell you that it's here at this moment of compromise that begins to plateau. Why? Because he took it out of God's hand and started depending on government instead. Now the anointing of everything that's happening is going to begin to diminish because of compromise. The emperor Constantine allegedly converted to Christ in 312 A.D. He made the Edict of Milan in 313, and eventually in 380, Christianity becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire. And that so compromised biblical Christianity that you could almost not discern it from the world at all. We can't compromise. We can't say we're going to depend on pragmatic government decisions and half-truths to advance our God's work. We just can't. He, tried, he thought he was doing right. He thought he was doing them a favor. But he was killing the work. The gospel was changing lives. It was changing the world. Now let me ask you as we come to a close today. Who won between Artemis and Jesus? <laughs> Is it even close? Artemis was a rock. The image of Artemis was a rock, a bumpy rock. Jesus is the image of God, a stone that makes men stumble. Artemis was the goddess of the hunt with breasts all over her body. Jesus is the Lamb of God with wounds all over his body.
stripes and scars and nail-pierced hands and feet. Artemis allegedly made people wealthy. Jesus makes people whole. Artemis was empowered by evil spirits. At the name of Jesus, evil spirits flee. Artemis makes crowds rage and riot. And Jesus was a person to person bringing peace to the hearts of everyone who received him as Lord. Who won, Jesus Jesus or Artemis? It's not even close. It's a silly question. It's a silly question. The temple of Artemis is gone. All that's left is that one pillar standing in a field. That's it. That's all that's left. And Jesus' light is just as bright as the night it shone over him in the manger. He hasn't diminished at all. He's still on the rise. And the branches still continue. So the question is not who wins, Artemis or Jesus. That's a silly question. But the real question is who wins you as you face your idols? Some of these idols are are God-given gifts to you, like your children. They're sports. Nothing wrong with playing sports. Fishing, Ron. Nothing wrong with fishing. Right? Nothing wrong with hunting. Nothing wrong with being out in the sunshine on a day like today. Y'all ready for me to finish so you can go there? But these are gifts from God. They are not our reason for being. We should give thanks to God for the gifts and lay down our idols and lift up the king of our hearts. Let me pray for us. God, we love you so much. And God, as we come to this time, I pray with all my heart that we've been able to see our idols. And God will choose you. God, I know in this room right now, people are wrestling with relationship, the idol of relationship, that boy, that girl, that man, that woman, the spiritual adultery that we're being tempted to commit, wealth and possessions, pleasures, even family. Oh, God, help us to find our meaning and our identity in you and you alone. We pray now for those that need to give their life to you for the first time. And pray, God, now for those that need to re-give their lives because they've fallen in idolatry. We love you, Jesus. And it's in in your name that we pray. Amen.